Well, in our lifetime, the 20th year of the century will forever be remembered for the global coronavirus pandemic and an election that defeated a rude and unpopular president. 100 years ago, we were confronting different battles, including World War I and the right of women to vote. Since this month, we have taken to the polls, or in many cases to the mailbox, to exercise our right to vote, I thought it only fitting to highlight a prominent American woman, a knitter, who was alive at the time, and to give you some historical perspectives that informed her life and times. Let's start by taking a little look at the 19th Amendment. The 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution essentially says, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. So in this image, you see from 1912, a suffrage parade in New York City. In 1848, women and men met in Seneca Falls, New York to advance the cause for women's rights. The convention organized by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Martha Wright, Mary Ann McClintock and Jane Hunt marked the beginning of a formal women's suffrage movement. The men and women of the movement made speeches and petitioned Congress pressuring government officials to recognize the women's right to vote. Stanton, Mott, and suffrage advocate Susan B. Anthony did not live to see women get the right to vote. Instead, they paved the way for future suffragists like Alice Paul, Ida B. Wells, and Mabel Pinghua Lee. The women leading the women's suffrage movement were not always unified. Some suffragists thought only white women should exercise their right to vote. Others, like Charlotte Fortin Grimke, Mary Ann Shad Carey, and Mary Church Terrell, knew women of color also had a right to participate in electing government officials. The first constitutional amendment to secure votes for women was introduced to Congress in 1878. It failed. By 1919, suffragists get another amendment introduced to Congress that would secure women's right to vote. The 19th Amendment passed both, both the House and Senate. The states ratified the 19th Amendment in 1920, officially recognizing women's right to vote. While many women were able to head to the polls, the amendment did not give voting rights to all women. Women of color, immigrants, and lower income women were often deterred from voting by laws and social pressure. For example, Native American women were not considered U.S. citizens until 1924 and were not permitted to vote. Women who were convicted of a crime were also unable to vote, even if they completed their sentence. A century after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, women are still advocating for their rights. This activism would be impossible without the power of the vote that enables women to have a say in the democracy they live in. The 19th Amendment is a milestone in American history. Eleanor Roosevelt lived from 1884 to 1962. During those years, she was a champion of human rights, of course, the wife of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, mother to six children. She was a political activist, and most importantly to us, a ceaseless knitter. She produced baby garments, sweaters, and did war work, which we'll talk about in a little bit. She knitted at political conventions on trains and airplanes, as you can see here. After dinner parties, while serving at the United Nations and at informal family gatherings. As the wife of a young politician, she learned to sit and listen. Knitting allowed her to think 
while excluded from Democratic Party platform committee meetings during the 1924 convention. As she knitted, she absorbed what she heard and later was able to use the knowledge to, quote, play the game the way the men do. Here we have Eleanor Roosevelt voting in 1936, less than 20 years after the 19th Amendment guaranteed women the right to vote. I'm old enough to remember voting in one of these shoot machines. So for those of you who are younger or who live in a part of the country where these have never been used, let me walk you through it a little bit. You entered the booth, and by the way, my mother took me in with her as a child, like when I was a child, so I could see democracy in action. But after you enter this booth, you pull that thing that she's got her hand on, you slide it to the side, and those rickety cords that are hanging at the top of the screen, the curtains would pull shut behind you on those cords. So now you're enclosed in this very small booth that's maybe three feet by three feet. You don't have a lot of room to maneuver, but you really don't need to because all you're going to do is flip these little black switches under the name of the candidate who you want to vote for. Or if there's um, some other issue that's being voted on, I think that's probably what that panel on the left is. Longer things where you'd have to read more would be in a separate place. And then after you were done flipping, and the machine would lock up if you tried to vote for two people for the same office. So you could only select one. And in order to vote for the other one, if you made a mistake, you would have to deselect and reselect. After you were done making all of your choices, then you would pull that lever in the opposite direction. Your vote would be registered and the curtains would open and you could leave. Looking back on her political development, Eleanor Roosevelt wrote that she had her first contact with the suffrage movement rather late. In fact, she did not consider herself a suffragist until 1911 when her husband, Franklin D. Roosevelt, then a state assemblyman in New York, came out for women's right to vote. Quote, I realized that if my husband were a suffragist, I probably must be too. End quote. It was only in the 1920s that Eleanor Roosevelt became fully involved in the women's rights movement. Soon after moving back to New York City after the 1920 presidential election, Roosevelt became a board member of the New York State League of Women Voters and began to direct the League of Women Voters National Legislation Committee. With her move to the White House as First Lady in 1932, Eleanor found she had new sources of power to push for improvements for women's rights. She worked tirelessly to improve the access women had to New Deal legislation, notably by creating what were known as she-she-she camps, or women's organizations of the Civil Conservation Corps, CCC. Eleanor also held press conferences in which only female journalists could attend, a way she could subtly encourage women to maintain prominent careers. In the post-war years, Roosevelt continued her advocacy for women's rights at home and abroad. She continued to support the advancement of women in professional and political positions and supported the rights of working class women through labor unions and other organizations. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy asked Eleanor Roosevelt, who took the Kennedy administration to task for its lack of women in federal appointments, to chair his presidential commission on the status of women. Eleanor was able to secure the appointment of Polly Murray, a seasoned activist in the movements for both women's and African-American rights, to draft the report. Unfortunately, she died before the committee's findings could be reported. Eleanor Roosevelt was constantly seen knitting. She was almost never seen without her knitting bag across her lap. Here she is knitting on, I think this is an airplane. 
Yes, the caption says, First Lady of the Land, First Lady of the Air, who has enjoyed the refreshing ease and comfort the time and money-saving economy of almost 100,000 miles of air travel in the past four years. Mrs. Roosevelt says, quote, I never cease to marvel at the airplane, unquote. This was from an advertising poster that promoted the safety of airplane travel. And it's from the Smithsonian. During World War II, between 1941 and 1945, people were called into action to knit to help the war effort and keep American soldiers warm. In fact, the cover story of Life magazine was even explaining to them how to knit. Instructions and patterns were available in the article. And while people were asking, what can I do to help the war effort? The answer came back, knit. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt was often photographed knitting for the war effort. She effectively launched that effort at a knit for defense tea party held at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City on September 31st, 1941. The question of why garments should be knit by hand arose during the war. Knitters responded by saying that donations cost nothing, and that hand knit socks outlasted machine knit ones. It also helped women feel that they were an active part of the conflict and not useless. The American Red Cross was responsible for organizing a lot of this knitting effort. Like so many other products, wool was in short supply during the war. Wool production had been interrupted worldwide. The wool that was produced was difficult to ship and the War Production Board set strict quotas on how wool could be sold and what could be made from it. The Red Cross supplied patterns for sweaters, socks, fingerless mitts, and all sorts of other war essentials. While lots of metal things were being melted down to help the war effort, knitting needles were deemed too immediately useful and were not melted. Advertisements notify people where they could purchase the right type of yarn, the right colors. And back then, a four ounce skein cost about 75 cents. They were also told that knitting a helmet for a soldier would take them about four hours. Eleanor Roosevelt wasn't the only first lady to knit. Lou Henry Hoover, the wife of Herbert Hoover, was also known to be a knitter. And here you see her and a famous blanket that she knit. This episode is in honor of Armistice Day, AKA Veterans Day, November 11th, and to honor all veterans everywhere, including my late grandfather who served in World War I. Thank you.